sure thing. Just too many little electronic things up here. It's so cool. One of the nastiest things to ever watch and witness is when you get two old timers together and they start comparing their scars. Well, here's where I broke my leg. Well, here's where I got 47 stitches in a knife fight. Well, here's the bullet hole wound I got in World War II. Well, here's my last surgery where they just cracked me open and laid me on the table. I've seen a few of these. They're pretty nasty to watch. We are not going to talk about scars today. We are not going to talk about external wounds. But we are going to talk about some pain on the inside. Now, where do these hidden hurts come from? You know, things like painful memories, uh, recollections you want to keep secret, but they still come back and gnaw at you. And maybe you were abandoned, or maybe you were rejected, or maybe you feel like you just don't belong, you don't measure up. Maybe somebody just made fun of you. Your hidden hurts come from everywhere. You get them through society, through prejudice and injustice. You can be wounded by your family, and they probably hurt the most. You can be wounded at school by other children. We went to Hattie's uh, birthday party yesterday. I think they were all third graders. Wow, brutal. I don't, know, I don't see how they survived in the third grade. They can be hard on each other. Your friends can betray you. Your job, your employer can betray you. As a pastor, I've discovered that everybody has these hidden hurts. You don't want anybody to know about yours, but you got one. Peter, in this section of the book that we're going through, addresses pain on the inside. And he has four pieces of advice today. Very simple message, take home. Number one, to heal these hidden hurts that you carry, we all carry, forgive the offender. So then Peter begins. Since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourself with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. Now, Jesus understood physical pain. I mean, you think about it. Nail prints in the hands and the feet, stripes on the back, the spear that pierced his side, the crown of thorns that cut into the very flesh. But he had these hidden wounds as well. He was betrayed. He was rejected. He was hated. He knows what it's like to be mistreated. So Peter says, when you go through some pain external or internal, you need to be ready with the same attitude Jesus had. And on the cross, we, we know that. It says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That was the attitude of Jesus on the cross. Bear in mind, he could have blown them away. He didn't have to hang on the cross. As the old hymn said, he could have called 10,000 angels. But he didn't. And if you're going to ever be healed of the pain you carry inside, you have to forgive the offender. We say, I don't want to forgive them. They don't deserve it. And you're absolutely right. They don't deserve it. Forgiveness is never deserved. Then why should you do it? Why am I up here preaching this, that something has go so counterculture? And the point is this, you will never be asked to forgive someone else more than what God has already forgiven you. You're going to need forgiveness in the future. Just a fact. In fact, there's a line in the Lord's Prayer that says, Father, forgive me as I forgive others. As. 
in the same way. Father, I want you to forgive me just like I forgive the people around me. You realize that when you say that prayer? Is that it or attitude? You're willing to say, God, I'll take anything from you because I'm going to dish it out first. I'm going to forgive them. Someone once said, He who won't forgive burns the bridge he has to walk across to get to heaven. Another man actually asked John Wesley, made a statement, he said, I could never forgive that man. And John Wesley said, Then I hope you never sin. You're never going to stop hurting until you forgive. It's the only way to let go of the pain. Resentment is always going to hurt you more than the other person. Look, it was 10 years ago. You still resent it, and when you think about it, you make yourself miserable. The other person has totally forgotten about it. They've moved on. They don't even think about it. Who is the only person being hurt? Yeah, you and me. Forgive the offender. Now, number two. Peter continues, says, focus on God. He says this. No, actually, okay. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you've finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your life chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. Now, if you're carrying the pain, Peter says, take the focus off of yourself, put the focus back on on God. And he's kind of blunt here. He's saying, if you have suffered pain physically because of your faith, why would you ever go back into the world? Why would you ever go back into the selfish desires of this culture? Why wouldn't you just want to hang in there and be devoted to doing God's will? You know, God keeps a record of every tear you shed. Your pain matters to God. He feels it. He wants to help you. And you really can't stop rehearsing it over and over again because God will remember. God will eventually balance the book. Nobody in life gets off scot-free. God balances the books. So trust your hidden wounds to Christ. And you can have hope, joy, peace. Or you can go ahead and stay in misery, depression, and resentment. It's your choice. But you're number one, you have to forgive. And number two, you've got to refocus. Now, number three, and this is, this is not Peter. This is Job. It says, face the future. But Job says, put your heart right. Reach out to God. Then face the world again, firm and courageous. Then all your troubles will fade from your memories like floods that are part, past and remembered no more. Put your heart right. Forgive the offender. We said that. Reach out to God. Focus on God. We said that. And then face the world again. Peter's going to say it like this. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy. <coughs> Their immorality and lust their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties and their terrible worship of idols? Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. So they slander you. But remember, they will have to face God who will judge everyone, both the living and the dead. You learned a universal principle when you was a little kid and you've forgotten it most likely. When you were a kid, you were riding a bike and you fell off. And you thought the world was going to come to an end because you were in incredible pain. And your mom or dad said, it's going to be okay, let's go get ice cream. And then immediately you were healed. You see, you thought about the future and you took your mind off the past. And one of the keys to actually forgetting the past is start focusing on the future. You want to get rid of bad memories in your past, make some great memories in your future. Peter says, hey, you're done with all this stuff. 
He said all this immorality and lust and living on the edge and abusing every substance and worshiping everything except God. You know, it might have temporarily felt good. It might have given you a high, but it didn't last. It didn't get rid of the pain. It didn't solve anything. The world offers a very cheap, a very temporary kind of a painkiller. And they work to a degree for a while, but they don't work forever. The only thing that works forever is the God of forever. You need to face your future. Forgive and then face the future as you focus on God. The last one's a bigger one, and I want you to see this one a little closer. Form part of the community of believers. Peter ends this section. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself was speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Well, do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Now there's something here that Bible scholars point out. The people of the first century, even the apostles apparently, really expected Jesus to return in just a matter of a few short years. And it's been 2,000 years now, and he has not returned. Sometimes that might explain the apathy and the lethargy that is in today's church. And it may also explain why the church of the first century grew so fast, because they expected Christ to come. Now, I got news for you. It may have been 2,000 years, but it's feeling close again. It's really feeling like it's something that's going to happen soon. And so maybe you should at least consider on a daily basis, what if Jesus came today? Point here, though, as Peter says, in light of the fact that Jesus is coming soon, I want you to stay disciplined in your prayer life. Don't quit praying. And I want you to keep that deep love going for each other. Don't stop loving. And he says, be hospitable. Open up your home. You know, if somebody needs a meal, give them a meal. They need a place to stay. And then he starts talking about spiritual gifts. If you're not familiar with a spiritual gift, God promises every new believer a special ability. In the first century, some were we would call miraculous, supernatural. But even in the first century, many of them were just normal, natural, but as a passion for these different things. And Peter just simply says that if you get the gift of encouraging each other, then you encourage, like there's no end to encouragement. If you have the gift of helping others help each other, just keep going. Do use what you got. What's all that have in common? Well, what's the common theme of what I just said? Community. We are not a bunch of people coming to church. We are the church who is coming together to share this day. You need community for healing. You can heal alone but you will heal so much faster and more fully within a community of believers. You need people in your lives. The world thinks that I get this community from the bar or social club or even some faceless social media. 
But you need to understand that there's probably no better place than right here to find this kind of community. That's why God made the church. That's why the writer of the book of Hebrews says, you should not stay away from church meetings. As some are doing, but you should meet together and encourage each other. And understand church meetings are not to come here and bash each other's brains out. It's not to come here and let me make you feel so miserable and guilty. It's not to come here and judge each other. It is to encourage. That's why every Lord's Day, that's the overall objective. As we sing, as we learn, as we pray, it is to encourage one another. How you do it, real quick, you do it through small groups. You go into a group where people actually learn more about you and who you are. And they pray with you because they know what needs prayer. And if they're sick, they can come watch your kids or visit in the hospital. It's where you learn that I'm not alone. There are other people in this community that wrestle with the same problems I, I wrestle with. And we also do it in ministries. You know, God never meant the church to be a one-man superstar where the pastor flies in wearing his Superman cape and, cape and tights, does his holy little thing, and then flies out the building. From the very, very beginning, God meant church to be a community. Over 70 times in the Bible, there's this phrase called one another. You know, like love one another, support one another, greet one another with the holy kiss. That's one of my favorites. Pray, counsel, help, support. These one another commands, and they are commands, they can't be done if you're sitting home in your living room. They can't be done even if you're out on the lake fishing, as much fun as that might be. You have to be around the people. You have to minister to the people to be able to obey these commands. Look, that's what church is about. It has never been about coming here and singing some songs and listening to a message and then walking out separate directions. It has been about encouraging one another to be this community, to be this family. Look, everybody has a hidden hurt, excuse me. What's yours? You want to be healed from it. You want to get over it. The first step is what we said last Sunday. We saw it. It is to step over the line. It's to sign the pledge, the dotted line on a contract that says, I am now following you, Jesus. Just to be baptized, we saw with DJ last Sunday. You don't have to understand it all. It is not about a bunch of rules and regulations to design to make you guilty, feel guilty. It is about discovering who Jesus truly is. And it is through that that you discover healing mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Think over it. Think about it. As we ask you to stand to share one final song with us this morning.